All righty. Hey, go ahead. Pick up your workbook. You guys got your workbook? Put it up high in the air, Tom. We're going to celebrate tonight. High in the air. Take a look at that thing. Put it back down because that's all you're going to do. Anyway, so we got about another week, maybe. <laughs> maybe another week, and I think maybe next week we'll get into it, but we got a little bit to deal with because we're still in, that's right, world religions, cults, and the occult, and we're on the fifth topic there with Buddhism. Now, what we've been seeing, the reason why for the last few weeks we haven't been in quite in the workbook yet is because Buddhism, amongst other things, are, all, are spinoffs, basically, of what we saw the last time for six weeks, and that was the religion of Hinduism, okay? And uh, so we've already seen already with the, the Baha'is, the spinoff, Jainism, Zoroastrian, Hare Krishna, Taoism, and Shintoism, where we left off uh, last time. How many guys went home after last week and tortured yourself with Japanese anime, with all due respect? I didn't either. That's enough for me for various reasons. But anyway, that's right. So we are in the nether one, and hopefully you guys don't get too confused on this one, but now we're going to look with another spinoff, and that's Confucianism. Okay, Confucianism. Now, uh, if you guys, how many guys think if you prayed and, and fasted for a good 15 days, Tom, maybe even attended that prayer and fasting conference with meals included, you could figure out who in the world that this religion came from? Anybody? You're not confused, are you? Confucius, that's right. You guys are on the ball. That's right. Uh, he was a guy basically 551, 479 BC. And he was a Chinese teacher, an editor, a politician, a philosopher uh, in the Chinese uh, time period there. Uh, he emphasized personal and governmental morality, correctness of social relationships, justice, and sincerity. So basically, once again, a spinoff, as we're going to see with Hinduism, is you're looking at, once again, a works-based okay, salvation. Okay, that you can just do it. You can pull it up by your own bootstraps. You can do it yourself. As we've seen before, again, anybody who says to you, all religions are basically the same, just told you they don't know anything about biblical Christianity, and they certainly don't know anything about other religions. Other religions say that you are God, you can become God, or somehow you can work your way to God. It's a common, repeated mistake, because you can't work your way to God. It's a free gift from Jesus Christ. Okay, but that's what he emphasized. Now, Confucius is uh, traditionally credited with having authored many uh, classic Chinese texts okay, that came from him, but scholars are cautious of attributing specific assertions to Confucius himself uh, because like with Muhammad, like with some of these other guys, their teachings weren't compiled until many, many, many years after their death. So don't be confused, Reed. Uh, it may, it may not be from this guy. We just really don't know, okay? Uh, but that's really what's uh, going on there. Now, what is it? Well, again, it's basically humanism, kind of an optimistic humanism. It's kind of what's being presented in Hollywood today. Mankind, all the disaster movies, what happens? Mankind blows up, and that's the end of the movie. Oh, no, usually somehow we end up surviving. We figure a way. It's the human triumph. The human spirit can prevail. Well, it's that kind of thing that you can make it even in the afterlife. And in this life, too, you can just do it yourself. And that's kind of what it is uh, in a nutshell. It deals with moral conduct, ethical living. Now, a couple of primary things that they have to, to nail it down a little bit is a couple of things. And the first one is what we saw last time with, with uh, the Shintoism. And that's uh, what's important with Confucianism is, once again, ancestor worship. Okay, And the Bible, as we saw several times, condemns that because how many guys realize that an ancestor that's dead is kind of dead? Yeah, you guys, man, you're not confused at all tonight. This is great. Uh, yeah, and the Bible says you don't try to speak with the dead because you're either straight into heaven or you're straight into hell and you don't come back. And if anything shows up on the premises, it's a demon. It's a familiar spirit trying to dupe you. It ain't Aunt Vera, whoever, Abraham Lincoln, whatever they say they are. Okay, but this is their big thing, ancestral worship. It's a big part with that. And uh, they believe that these ancestors, you got to do certain things. Remember, we saw last time with Shintoism, you actually burn some cash so they can have some money in the afterlife and it's... What a racket, but anyway, whatever, that's what they believe. Uh, but somehow these dead spirits, these ancestors, influence your life today. So basically they get to control you even after you move out of the house when you're 18, and even when they're dead, they still get you. Okay, but anyway, uh, but that's the big other. The other one is basically a piety or respect, okay, of the elders with children. That's a big issue. And, th and that's not a bad thing, right? Don't, we should respect our elders, right? Okay, and uh, that, that's a good thing. But again, it's the ancestor worship kind of mixed into it. But it's a works-based salvation, okay, if you will, that you can just do it yourself. You don't need God. And basically, you got some primary principles. Listen to this. Jen, J-E-M, is basically Confucius' golden rule, right? Uh, do unto others, if you will. Uh, Chun Tai, for those of you hooked on trying to spell this, uh, is the gentlemanly man of virtue. These are the things, basically the primary things, your goals in life. 
If you're going to follow confusion, you need to do Jin and Chun Tai. Uh, Cheng Ming, which is the proper plane of society roles, try to be a good citizen, if you will. Uh, te, T, you have to pronounce, the power of virtue. Li, the ideal standards of conduct. And Wen, W E M, the peaceful arts, uh, poetic uh, music, etc., etc. Now, what I found was interesting, because we saw that basically, uh, when you look at Taoism especially, but we're going to see some elements of other uh, religions too, are the uh, tenets behind Star Wars, right? And we're going to get into that again maybe in a couple weeks, okay, as well as uh, martial arts. But did you know that <clears throat> there's a term that they have that when you basically have mastered, if you will, this Confucianism, right? When you, everything that you do is you are the expert on Confucius ideals, okay? You exemplify the character of a, a Confucianism. And do you know what that term is? It's called Ren. Anybody see the new Star Wars movie? What's one of the uh, main characters, the bad guy? Kylo Ren. But I'm sure it's just a quinky dink, Tom, this, this Ren aspect, okay? Uh, but again, this is the, they say basically, uh, uh, Confucius' most uh, outstanding student uh, asked him, uh, what, what's this, how do you get to this uh, state of Ren? Okay, and he says, one should see nothing improper, hear nothing improper, say nothing improper, do nothing improper, uh, basically never leave your house and live in a closet. I don't know, but anyway, that's basically what it is. And uh, basically it says this, Ren's also got a political dimension to it, uh, states that if a ruler lacks this Ren, okay, it will be difficult for his subjects to behave humanely. So that's basically the, uh, the uh, exemplification of this teaching. But again, I thought it was kind of interesting. We saw with the force and the and the chi and all that stuff, and the yoga and the guru, and it's all kind of blending together with Eastern mysticism uh, with Star Wars. But again, we'll get into that later. But the uh, Confucius espoused basically self-effort. You don't need room for God. He taught that man is capable of doing everything necessary to improve his life and culture, relying on himself, right? Okay, but what's the Bible say? Are, are we able to clean up our act to make ourselves worthy and acceptable to God? Is mankind the ultimate hope for uh, humanity to experience true peace and all that stuff? No. True peace only comes back, right, Bobby, until the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, comes back and rules and reigns on this planet in the millennial uh, kingdom. But that's basically what it is. The Bible also teaches that we are inherently sinful at birth, incapable of doing any of these good works uh, that they say is going to fix everything. And again, it focuses on the abilities of mankind. Now, that's Confucianism. The next one we're going to get into is... Uh, Oh, excuse me, they're sick. <laughs> Sickism or Sikhism, okay? Uh, but uh, hopefully it doesn't make you too sick. Uh, hopefully it makes sense tonight. But Sikhism is basically a blend between two religions. Once again, Hinduism, but also Islam, okay? That's basically what it is, a blending of the two, okay? Uh, it started by this guy named Nanak, okay? How would you like to have that name? Yeah, let's just move on. Nanak, okay, uh, 1469, 1538. He was, listen to this. Here's how, he, how did he derive? right? Uh, he was born a Hindu father and a Muslim mother in India, okay? First of all, big no-no in Islam, but somehow they had the child, Nanak, and he said to have received a direct call from God. Where's that noise when you need it? Wrong answer, okay? Anytime somebody says, I got a direct call from God, God speaks to me, run, okay? You want a direct word from God? Here it is. What are you called to do? Share the gospel, live a holy life, case closed. You didn't need 40 days to figure that out, Okay? And you don't need some vision, okay? But that's what he, he got this direct call from God and established him as a guru. Now, what you're going to see is a blending of the terms because he came from the two backgrounds, Islam and Hinduism. Uh, he, he soon became known in the Punjab region in northeast India for his devotion and piety and bold assertion. Here was his big statement that he walked around and made, there is no Muslim and there is no Hindu. Okay, that was his big thing. He came up with something new. And he, considered, he grew a bunch of disciples around him, which were called Sikhs. That's what that word means, disciples. So basically, disciple-ism uh, in the uh, language there, Sikhs. He taught that God is one. Well, that's just like Christianity. No, once again, just like Islam, is it the same God? Is Allah the same God? Absolutely not. Okay, not the same as the God of the Bible, okay? And so he taught that there's one God, but he also taught, okay, the name of God at Ekankar, E-K-A-N-K-A-R. I don't have time to get into that, but this is what's funny about uh, New Age. So all these different, uh, and we'll get into that in great detail in our next section, Lord willing. And all these splinter off. You think Hinduism is splintered off? <laughs> New Age, man. It's just as bad. Okay, because partly because it's based on Hinduism, right? 330 uh, different, million different gods. You just go any direction you want, make it up as you go. 
And, uh, but anyway, New Age, there's this one movement called Ekankar in New Age, and it's supposed to be this new movement. New, no, it's not. You ripped it off from Sikhism. If people don't know what Sikhism is, eh, they just get, they swallow it. But uh, Ekankar, that name comes from Ek, meaning one, Alm, a mystical sound uh, uh, expressing deity, whatever, and Kar, meaning Lord. And uh, anyway, so he also retained, though, the doctrines of reincarnation and karma. Okay? So, again, the blending of the two. Now, he taught that one can escape the reincarnation cycle through a mystical union with God, uh, through devotion and chanting, right? And uh, he also had, uh, basically, was, uh, was followed by an unbroken line of nine appointed gurus, okay, uh, that followed him there. And uh, Sikhism, they say, was originally pacifist, right? Supposed to be peaceful. But it didn't stay that uh, way for long, because guess who? When a certain religion found out that you were rejecting Muhammad, guess what happened? They came to kill them. And that's exactly what happened. Excuse me? You're going to sit there and try to blend this with Allah? Uh Uh-uh. And what does Islam teach? We clearly saw verbatimly. We're going to kill you. That's the Sharia law thing that they want to institute all around the world, including the United States. You say anything bad about the Quran, you die. You say anything bad about Muhammad, you die. Okay, and on and on and on it goes, okay? So that's what they did. They came after this guy <clears throat> in this religion, okay? And, uh, but basically, by the time of the 10th guru, okay, uh, they basically began to defend themselves. Uh, and this guy rose up. His name is, uh, he's the 10th guru of the Sikhism. His name is Gobin Singh, or the lion. And these are what was called the Khalsa, okay, the Khalsa warriors, okay? They basically created their own warrior group, okay? And they were a class of world-renowned uh, Sikh warriors, okay, and uh, they had uh, certain characteristics by their five K's. They were known by their five K's, uh, and that basically was this. They had the kesh, or long hair. They had the kanja, the steel comb in the hair. Uh, they had the kach, the short pants. They had the kara, the steel bracelet, and they had the kerb pan, a short, uh, a sword or dagger uh, that was worn on the side, and every day for breakfast, they had special K. <laughs> no, that's the six K, Bobby. There's only five. And I know you were thinking that. Let's move on. Uh, but the British, I don't know if you've seen some of the, maybe the Indiana Jones movies or some of the old uh, British movies that they're over there in India, right? And you'd see these guys that they would hire with them, the British, okay? And there was these basically guys with the turbans and big old gnarly curving looking swords. These were these guys, okay? They became legendary warriors, okay? Because basically Islam was going after them to kill them, okay? But eventually Islam did finally kill the 10th guy, the Gobind Singh, he was assassinated, and he was the last human guru. So now what? You don't have a guru, so how do you keep on going forward? Well, what they did is they actually took their, what's called their holy book, the Adi Granth, okay, the Adi Granth, okay, and basically they said, okay, this is now our guru. And they basically said, this book now forever will be our guru, and they gave the book divine status. So I guess that's one way that you can't end the religion. As long as you got that book, that's your permanent guru, Okay. Now, uh, Sikhism and Christianity obviously are not the same thing. Again, once again, they have a a version of God who's impersonal. Is that what the Bible says? No, we have Abba Father, very personal, loving, uh, intimate relationship. So how could you ever say that all religions teach the same thing? Very, very different. Also, uh, uh, Christianity, God is not going to be combined with any other religion. Right? There's only one God, as God clearly states. Uh, before him, there is none. After him, there is no other beside him. There is no God, etc., etc., Isaiah. Uh, Sikhism also denies the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus, not only his uniqueness, but salvation is only through him. Do you do it through devotion and chanting and all Hinduism, and you try to escape kar- uh, karma and all with karma and the reading cycle of reincarnation? No. Okay? Once again, it's absolutely uh, incompatible, uh, as we saw before, uh, with the issue of uh, uh, re- reincarnation and karma as well. Also, they would say that their book, the Adi Granth, is the only inspired, if you will. Is that true? No. Uh, what do we say? We say the exact same thing, right? But do we say it blindly? No. We've, many, many times we've taken a look at the philosophical, logical, historical, archaeological, even scientific evidence. This is the, unlike any other book on the planet in all of human history and reliable, unlike these other ones that were written on bark and palm leaves. And many, many years after people died, hope they got it right. Okay, uh, radically different. Okay, so you can't merge those two, right? Uh, they both can't be the absolute authority. That's illogical. Okay, now this leads to another element, okay, of Islam. Okay, and if you recall in our Islam study, we kind of broke it down into two major groups, but I want to get into the third one tonight. Now, the two major groups we saw that you break down uh, <clears throat> with Islam, you got the Sunnis and you got the Shiites, Right? And uh, basically, you're looking like around 80% or so, and you know, around 20% or so, 
uh, you know, again, roughly, and of course, this isn't going to add up to 100%, but there's a smaller one uh, element that we're going to talk about, and that's your Sufis, okay, the Sufi Muslims, okay? And remember the, the, the problem that we have with this, well, first of all, a division is a sin according to Allah and his people. Oops, you got sin all over the place. You got major different uh, groups there, and we saw that before. Also, as we saw before, uh, most people want to say, well, it's just these small numbers of Shiites are the ones that are the terrorists and doing the bad things. No, it's not. As we saw, that's a lie, okay? The Sunnis, the majority, they admit, and we saw them on tape, they were willing to do the same thing uh, for all as well. But the Sufis, as we, I, I don't know if you guys recall, but I mentioned back then, is basically this is the small yet charismatic form of Islam. Okay, these guys are kind of more charismatic uh, uh, in their things. And one of the things that they do that I want to talk about, because it goes into Hinduism, Hinduism again, you get a vision, right? You get into an altered state of consciousness. What? Well, they actually have a charismatic Islamic version of that, and it's what's called Sufi, the Sufis, it's called Sufi whirling, okay, Sufi whirling, or what's also called, you guys might have heard this term, the whirling dervishes, okay, I was with them, and basically these guys, and I'm just going to show you a real quick picture of it, these are men, believe it or not, and they have these skirts on, and they go round and around and around, I'm not going to do this. Okay, excuse me. But anyway, that's what it is. But it's a form of active meditation which originated from the Sufis and it's still practiced today. Okay, and they have what's called Sufi dervishes and it's a customary dance. Now I'm going to take a little detour. Okay, we're going to look at uh, not only these guys, but you're going to look at how uh, we, we've seen many different ways there is to get into an altered state of consciousness, right? Remember with drugs, remember with meditation, remember with breathing exercises, remember with uh, repetitive movement, repetitive speech, mantra, things of that nature, okay? But believe it or not, you can also do it by dance. And this is a classic way to do it uh, in the occult and different religions. And this is one of the ways they do it. This is what this Sufi whirling is, okay? Let's take a look. The aim is, okay... Uh, going around, 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 okay, uh, is to reach the source of all perfection, and this is sought by abandoning one's ego or personal desires as you're wearing this skirt going round and round and round. That would naturally get rid of your ego, I thought, personally, as a guy. There ain't nothing left after that. So, but anyway, so you get rid of your ego, right? And you listen to music and supposedly focus on Allah, and you spin your body in repetitive circles, uh, which is supposed to be a symbolic initiation of the planets in the solar system orbiting the sun. Yeah, whatever. You're just going in circles. Okay. <clears throat> now, the dervish practice uh, in the rituals, uh, they, they have, uh, they, first of all, they uh, say an Islamic prayer. They remember Allah. And there they go, man. They start going to town, going around and around, and uh, dancing and whirling in order to what? Reach a state assumed by outsiders to be one of ecstatic trances. So you keep doing this, and guess what? You're going to get whooped up into an altered state of consciousness, right? We only do it long enough till we puke and get a headache. But apparently you keep going on long enough on the merry-go-round. And uh, how many guys had nephews or nieces, man? And that was, that was like your goal in life. Oh, yeah, let's go to the merry-go-round. <laughs> and let's learn about centrifugal force, a scientific law. Angular momentum as you fly off, you will spin in the same direction. <laughs> let's move on. Apparently that was just... Reed, who did that? But anyway, let's move. <laughs> but anyway, Sufi whirling, in addition, they play, of course, music instruments, but they also do some other interesting things, too. I guess spice it up. Uh, consuming glowing embers, uh, live scorpions, and glass, puncturing body parts, and needles and spikes. Okay. I don't know if that's just to justify the pain of wearing that skirt. I don't know. Uh, whatever, with all due respect. Or practicing clairvoyance and levitation. Okay, it sounds weird, but you, know, you guys know what? Have you ever seen the pictures of these guys? And they're just going round and round and round, dancing round and round and round, round, right? And apparently it gets you into an altered state of consciousness, okay? Uh, they're still active today in more of the central Islamic area uh, in the regions, okay? Men has historically been the only ones taking part of this, but they're recently opening it up to women, okay, in these dances. But what's interesting is uh, it's also being promoted. I kid you not, I had to, I had to highlight this one. It's being promoted as... A stress relief. <laughs> you remember we saw like with yoga and meditation. Oh, it's, it's not a religion. It helps you with your back. It calms you down. It's, what are, you, are you serious? I'm just thinking about having to do this with a skirt on. I ain't getting, I'm stressing out. It wouldn't work on me. But apparently people fall for it. But listen, but then I had to write this out. Listen to this, man. This is, this is crazy. The Guinness World Book of Records for the most Sufi worlds in an hour was in 2015, Nicole McLaren with 3,552 rotations in one hour. 
Wow. And the largest continuous whirling performance has been recorded at more than four hours nonstop. Yeah, you're going to get a vision, all right, and then you're going to share your inner self. <laughs> get your vision off of me. Keep your vision to yourself, but okay. But anyway, that, that's an altered state of consciousness. Dance. Now, there's another group. We're going to get into this in much more detail, Lord willing, in the New Age section, but I just want to give you, I'm on the dance theme, altered state of consciousness, Hinduism, get a vision, right? Okay, kind of the charismatic issue. Uh, and there's another group that does this as well, and that's what's in the group, what's called shamanism, okay? Kind of the witch doctor, okay? American Indianism, but a lot of cultures around the planet are into shamanism, okay? And things of that nature. But a shaman is a person an entity who uh, teaches altered states of consciousness in order to perceive and interact with the spirit world and channel these energies into this world. So basically, they're supposed to be like a medium, a go-between. Again, Deuteronomy 18, what's it say? Don't mess with these people, okay? And, and, and again, with American Indians, that's why they push certain uh, drugs, peyote and things that, mescaline, things of that nature, because that, it'll, and again, I've, how many times have I said this before? Having been there, done that, wish I wouldn't have bought the t-shirt, all the you know, people today, when they're taking drugs, they say, oh, yeah, it's just entertainment, taking a trip, you know, stress relief, partying. No, you're not. It's, you're opening spiritual doors, right? And you don't want to mess with it. It's not just for fun, okay? And it ain't going to be fun. You keep going down there. And anybody who ever has unfortunately gone down the drug route, does it get better as you go? It gets darker as you go. And you become a bigger slave, okay? Because it's demonic, okay? A shaman is a person regarded as having access to and influence in that world of spirits. And they enter into a trance state during a ritual. And then out of that ritual, they're supposed to have this power. And they can practice uh, uh, divination, bring up spirits, or healing. And again, we're going to get into this in New Age because that's another big baloney that's going on there. Uh, with uh, reflexology and all these other kind of things that's going on. Uh, with uh, holistic healing, hands-on of healing, and heat massage, and all this other stuff that they do. And, and people say, oh, I, f- it, I felt the heat. Well, doesn't mean it's from God. Right? And it's common in those practices. Now, I had to throw this in there. I'm not making this up, Reed. And you can look at my notes later. Shamanism. You tell me this is an evil, Tom. They use a rooster in shamanism. Listen to this. This guy's in trouble. When he journeys to the unknown, it's said that he takes a rooster with him. And it's said that the rooster will shield the shaman from wandering evil spirits by making him invisible. Are you kidding me? He'll give you away every time. <laughs> right? And the evil spirits see only the roostlers. I do agree with this part. Useless spirit. Okay, you got me on that one. I had to throw that in there. But anyway, so well, how do they do it? Well, there's different ways, drugs. But again, guess what is one of the ways? Okay, and you see the movies with the Indians. Hey, what are they doing? It's dancing. Really? Oh, look at that neat entertainment. No, it's not. You're trying to connect with the spirits, okay? Music and songs, dancing, singing, medicine songs, uh, and the sweat lodge, right? All right? How many of you guys have ever been to, into a, a, a sauna, man? So long. It's like, man, I am seeing things. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's actually what they do. It gets you into an altered state of consciousness if you're not careful. I got to thinking about that. You know, it's, hey, man, that could happen here in Vegas in July, right? <laughs> but don't be coming up in July, Bobby, saying, hey, I got a vision. No, you're not. You're too hot getting your head in the air conditioner, okay? Uh, so don't fall for that. Uh, but anyway, that, but, but that's not all shamanism. Again, we're on the dancing, altered state of consciousness, another one. Another big one that does this, okay, is, and we're going to get into this, Lord willing, in much detail uh, later, Lord willing, witchcraft. Witchcraft is big about dancing in circles and things of that nature and conjuring up spirits and things of that nature uh, as well. But let's take a look at some of that aspect. Uh, first of all, some of the things I came across this, and again, we'll get into this in more detail, but to give you a little teaser of some of the things that will come out when we get into the occult section way over here and start at 5,322. In the occult section, uh, I want to give you a little teaser. There's a lot of crazy, evil wild things that go on and some of the things that we think are just fairy tales there's a meaning behind it okay including a lot of stuff that is about witches you've heard of witches they fly on a broomstick now that's not all just a bunch of baloney okay uh the broomstick uh was typically a stick that was given to a witch and uh, about 18 inches long okay uh and then what was given with the stick was a pot of an uh ointment okay but it wasn't just any ointment uh, it was a specifically a psychedelic drug, okay? And I don't know how to say this, um, but basically what they would do is they would take the stick and dip it in the psychedelic drug, and then they would put it between their legs, and then, of course, that would instantly uh, enter into the bloodstream much faster, 
and woohoo, yeah, you're flying pretty high, okay? And you're getting these visions and stuff of that nature, okay? So there is an element of dark, rotten stuff uh, with that as, as well. So, and it, basically, after that, they would have their hallucinations. Uh, and at these magical assemblies, the witches, uh, guess what they start to do? It's time to dance, right? You got this psychedelic drug going through, you're dancing. And while they sing and dance, they got uh, the broom in their hand, and they're holding it high and things of that nature. And uh, the dances were uh, circle dances. Sometimes they were back-to-back -back dances. Sometimes they were like congas, uh, wild ecstatic dances, ring dances, especially if there was a sacred stone or tree. They go around and around uh, that as well. Uh, the, the, the devil, they said, would play the pipes, lead the way with his tail wagging before the crowd and with a long stream of witches uh, at the highest pitch of excite, uh, excitement, uh, following in a line, uh, the flute, the drum, and other instruments uh, were used as well. Okay, so uh, again, how do they get this power? How do they get to get, connect with these spirits, which are demons? We know that, right? How do you get into this altered state of consciousness? A hallucinogen and things of that nature. Dancing, getting to an altered state of consciousness. Common theme today. And it's a good thing we don't see people stressing a lot of this behavior in even the church today. I'll get to that in just a second. There's another new movement. Uh, Brian turned me on to that last week. Uh, but another, I'll just give you a little teaser. Witches, right? How many guys have, uh, uh, you know where movies came from? Movies come from? Yeah, it rhymes with Hollywood. All two of you got it. Praise God. Okay. Now, there's actually uh, one of my contacts uh, with the background with people into witchcraft. Uh, they state that uh, there's certain wands, right? Because they have their paraphernalia, right? And there's certain wands that witches will make, okay? And uh, to specifically mesmerize people, right? Whether it works or not, whatever, but this is their teaching, right? And their belief to mesmerize people, and, but in order for this mesmerizing wand to work, it can only be made from a certain tree. It has to be made from a certain tree, and that certain tree is the holly tree. So you take wood from holly to make a mesmerizing, not you, holly, okay, and uh, I don't think you're wood. You look like flesh to me. So, uh, so isn't that interesting? So you, you use holly wood to make a wand to mesmerize people. Very interesting. That's some of the little teaser stuff we'll get into uh, as well. But anyway, but this is basically spinning. Oh, well, nobody's going to get into witchcraft and do the, that weird broom thing. That's kind of crazy. Oh, yeah. Actually, it's very big. Because of feminism, okay, uh, they are basically bringing what's uh, basically a revival movement back of warmed over witchcraft. It's the same thing as witchcraft. It's just called Wicca. Okay, and again, we'll get into that in much greater detail. But they have what's called the spiral dance or the grapevine dance or the weaver's dance. And basically, it's a, the feminist movement back from the 60s. They latched on to witchcraft. Okay, and they have what's called the reclaim movement. We'll get into this, uh, Lord willing, much later, the reclaim movement. And basically, they want to reclaim the woman's power, uh, the woman to be able to, you know, with witchcraft and things of that nature to uh, uh, get rid of man. It's also called the goddess movement. Okay, but they want to be the ones back in authority, get rid of the uh, male patriarch and all that stuff. Now you say, well, that's never going to happen in the church. It's kind of weird stuff, this dance stuff. Well, believe it or not, I did some research. Brian had turned me on to this uh, Sunday. And did you know there's a new dance craze even in the church today? It's coming in churches, right? Because people want to do this praise dancing thing, flag waving stuff and all that stuff. Well, there's another one. I'm not making this up. It's called crumping. Okay, crumping is a new kind of a hip-hop dance that's going on. But I'm going to read to you real quick an article, and it's not just a dance. Say, well, it's just hip-hop. It's just another form of dance. Mm, not, these people think that it's definitely got spiritual connections to it. Now, this is in the church. Listen to this. It says this. On, on a peaceful afternoon in a suburban home garage, Demetrius Leslie, 17, jerked like he was dosed with strychnine. This is the author of this article. His arms last menacingly, and then he dropped on the floor only to rear up smoothly. His chest popped in and out, convulsing as if an alien larva heaved within. He ranged from uh, around the garage, traveling or following the direction of his foot stomps and arm swings. Go, go, uh, his friends uh, yelled over the pounding music. In his spontaneity, speed, and mesmerized concentration, uh, they could see the telltale symptoms. Quote, Demetrius had got crump, praise the Lord. Crump is a frenetic dance born the West Coast. Uh, combining tribal-like dance and hip-hop at a blurring speed. And these guys, Leslie and his friends, say Crump truly is all about God. When you are going the fastest, woo, 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 okay, that's when you unleash, that's when, quote, God takes over. Really? Is that really God? Okay. 
It's the power of God that moves. It's God, man, he says. Uh, uh, Alexis, the girl, she's into it too, Hinton. Uh, in stark contrast, though, uh, her crumping, uh, she has a wolfish look. She bares her teeth while stamping and clawing at the air with outstretched arms. Despite the feminine bows on her uh, red flats, she is radiating anger. And crumping, she said, is a powerful emotional release. Well, that doesn't sound godly if that's what it's producing. Quote, the whole spiritual thing of it just hit me in the chest. And now they're acting differently. My whole mind has changed. It's supposed he came up with a guy named uh, Tommy the Clown, a hip-hop dancer uh, in California in the 1990s. And this, this the article, just this group, because this is all of the United States, okay, but just this, this group has performed 25 times during Sunday worship service at a Baptist church in Virginia. And listen to what he said. Lewis said some older congregants initially recoiled when they were crumping at the services. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And, uh, but he said the crumpers who, quote, feel the spirit when they're absorbed in their dance are in the zone. And some say there, there are no different than worshipers, listen, who writhe while shouting in the church. So again, now it's, right, we rolled over, except those people that, which we don't, uh, but those people that say this is the spirit of God and they're, they're laughing hysterically or they're rolling all over the floor or they're doing all this stuff. Or, uh, and, and so we've, uh, apparently the church has accepted that and these guys say, hey, this is no different. Just preparing people uh, for the next step. Okay, uh, Both transcend their earthly surroundings. Quote, when you get the spirit, then you give way. Give way to what? Very very interesting. Okay, so that's your little, little detour there we took on that. Seek is now. I'm, we're going to get into some spinoffs, what I call Western Hinduism, and I only have time for give you one more. Okay, and I was going to give you another one, but man, we'll save that for New Age. Okay, but this one basically a spinoff. You said, well, man, we're never going to do this. This is wild, crazy stuff. We're never going to do this here in the United States. Actually, there's whole entities, whole communities in the United States that are doing this. And one of them I just want to highlight tonight is what's called the farm. And you don't want to be growing no crops here. Okay, this is not a farm you want to be a part of. But the farm is in Tennessee. It's located on a, a three-square-mile campus, isolated area. Uh, and uh, the founder guy, uh, Stephen Gaskin, uh, openly declaring to be a messenger of God. Now, what should have every single one of these 1,200 people have done? Run. Once again, he became a messenger of God. And uh, he has these mystical religious experiences are encouraged, not only by him, but everybody else, along with a mixture of belief ranging from Tantra, which we saw was the really deep. I mean, it's all demonic because it's a false teaching, Hinduism. But when you get into the Tantra stuff, uh, yoga, which is the ritualistic kind of combining with sex and stuff, it's, it's the dark, really dark stuff. It's all bad, but it's bad. So they, he promotes that. Karma, mantras, uh, claim to be a, here's the problem. Okay, you're your own thing. They claim to be a non-denominational church. So they claim to be like a Christian entity. You've got to be kidding me, right? Okay. And they freely discuss, though, that all religion, you know, different options. So again, you think nobody's going to fall for that. Remember the stat we already saw, as crazy as this is, professing Christians, I'm not saying they all are, because how could you say this and be a Christian? When Jesus is the only way. 25% of the professing American church thinks that all paths lead to the same place. How could you, you just deny the cross of Christ? That's bare bones, bare bones, the gospel. How could you, anyway, so that's the issue. So that's what they teach. Now, they also claim to not only be a non-denominational church, all paths lead there, just join us on our little journey. But marijuana is a, a, sacred, a sacrament and can improve your relationship with God and family. Right? Why would they promote marijuana? Once again, how many times do I got to go through this? People say, oh, no, it's just a, a, a drug that's no big deal, and, and uh, you know, it's just for leisure and chilling out. No, it's not, right? Marijuana gets you into an altered state of consciousness, just like uh, the other ones that were mentioned before. So it is not a neutral thing. Now, what's crazy is we're seeing that marijuana is being allowed over and over and over and over again in our country. It's being legalized. I believe that's not by chance, because that is an increase of drugs on that scale, Revelation 9, open your Bibles, is exactly what's going to happen in the last days, right? So I'm not surprised, I don't agree with it, right? But I'm not surprised by it because we are going to see in the last days, prior to the return of Christ, this planet is going to be infested with drugs, okay? Revelation chapter 9, and let's take a look there, uh, that passage there. And uh, verse 20 
And it talks about this. Now, again, this is in the second half. This is the trumpet judgments. You've already gone through the seal judgments. You've already gone through all kinds of uh, uh, crazy, horrible stuff on the planet. Okay, uh, you've had the global false peace, the Antichrist arises, the, uh, you've got the global war, you've got a global famine, you've got a global death, one-fourth of mankind is annihilated by sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts. Uh, you've got a, a global earthquake, the sun turns black, the moon turns red, asteroids fall from the sky, the sky recedes, mountain and islands are removed from their places. Uh, you've got the first trumpet, you've got a hail of fire, a third of the earth and trees all burned up. The, the second trumpet, a huge asteroid, you've got blazing comets and all kinds of crazy. I mean, you, you think that that would get somebody's attention by now. Right? And again, I'm just ripping through some of this stuff. But I want you to give you the context when this statement is made. Right? Verse 20. The rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues still did what? Listen to how evil man is. Right? This whole thing. Oh, man will triumph. Man is great. Man will... Che- man is so stinking evil. Are you kidding me? If God didn't intervene, this whole planet would be toast. You'll never make it to the stars and improve and fly like Star Trek. No, you won't. We will self-destruct every single time. And man is not so good. He needs a savior. He needs Jesus Christ. Man is so wicked at this point that there were, those who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent. You kid me? You still didn't wake up after all that? Still did not uh, repent of the work of their hands, nor did they stop worshiping who? Oh, demons. So all this uh, connectivity with demons is going to become commonplace. Look at how many different angles it's coming in, even in the church. Okay? They didn't stop worshiping demons, idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, or wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual morality, or their thefts. Magic arts is the word that's pharmakeia, where we get pharmaceutical, and guess what that is? Drugs. Now, it's a twofold meaning that's there. It certainly is drugs, period, but it's drugs used to foster in the dark, dark arts, sorcery, things of that nature, that you need these drugs to get you into an altered state of consciousness connected with the demons. So it's kind of both in the same thing, right? So this is in the middle of the seven-year tribulation. So in order for this passage to come through, we are going to have to see uh, drugs permeate our planet on a massive scale like, and be accepted, even demonically accepted, like never before in the history of mankind. What do we see right now? It's all being prepared, man, for the seven-year uh, tribulation period. But these guys, that's what they promote. In 1970, a caravan of 60 school buses traveled 1,500 miles Okay, about 60 miles south of uh, Nashville, Tennessee. By 1980, the farm had grown to about 1,200 people. This exceeded the capacity of the land, so they purchased more acreage and changed their governmental system to accommodate their growth. They are basically a small town with their own hospital, with their own school, and their own radio station. And Ruth, they even got an act. It says it right here. Okay, uh, they're basically their own community. But again, what's the problem? Hey, if you want to do that, that's whatever. But what, who, who are they trying to be? A non-denominational church promoting all this baloney you got to be kidding me most are also vegetarians Uh oh starting to see a common thread here right somehow that movement and also they're very active in green communities huh so is the environmental movement being used to push uh witchcraft and paganism and mother earth worship gaia worship yeah we'll get to that lord willing uh in new age yes it is right go green right i said go brown and throw in the trash don't I'm against recycling. I'll put it on tape. Anyway, I'll probably get in trouble. No, I told you guys that story. Remember that one time? We had some folks visit us from Oregon. Okay, not the couple that was here last uh, Sunday, the pastor. They were great people. <laughs> and uh, Brandy and I, we just got done with a big old uh, uh, batch of ants, right? You guys ever get attacked by the ants? I mean, ants, when, you, when they, they're in your garbage, right? And you go in there and go, oh, what, did Brandy hang a new black drape in the pantry there? No, that's a wall full of crawling ants, millions of them. And you trace the trail, and they're coming from the trash can, and it's because of all the pop cans. They say, oh, you can't throw away. you got to recycle. That did it for me. <laughs> I refused to recycle for the rest of my life. Right? That was sick. That was gross. Man, remember that? It was just, man, it's like, like a horror movie. Right? So it almost made you want to do soupy whirling or something. I don't know. But uh, anyway, so, uh, anyway, so we got out of that habit, whatever. So we had these folks come down. It's just like, you know, recycle Rex, right? You recycle, right? You got to recycle. Save the planet. Save the planet. Right? And they came down here, and uh, so they, we had them over. Of course, we had some pop. Yes, it's called pop. For those of you thinking it's called soda, you're wrong. It was called pop, and uh, we just started a division in the church. But anyway, that's right. Let's just throw it out there. You want to get red carpet or blue carpet? We'll cause another division. I don't know. But anyway, so <laughs> anyway, so they came over there. I kid you not. I just, I, I just, I tried not to laugh because I mean they were like horrified because we just threw it in the trash, and they were like, we're just in the trash and moved on, and they were like. I, I remember that. I was just like, it was like, and we're like, 
What? Is it time for charades? You guys want to do Pictionary? What? This is fun. You guys are awesome. What guests? Right? No. I can't believe you didn't do it. They're stuck. Don't you ever suck? What? <laughs> anyway, so but people take this like it's a religious thing. Like, you're not going to save the planet. Wait till you see what God does to the planet in the seven-year tribulation. It's going to be trash. <laughs> right? So I'm preparing for the tribulation. But anyway, <laughs> Anyway, so, but it's a, my point in bringing that up is it's being used, okay, I'm not saying let's go out and let's go, nobody's for, uh, let's go pollute the fish, and we got people that there's uh, lead in the water. I'm, uh, that's horrible, right? We, that's common sense, right? And being a steward of the earth doesn't mean you trash the earth. I'm not saying that. But give me a break. I don't worship the earth, right? And you're not going to fix the planet. Jesus is. So, but the problem is this has become a religion to just pull people into this, uh, this mindset, and uh, they're earth-friendly. They, uh, uh, they also have their own publications. Remember, we saw different people witness in different ways. Well, these guys at the farm actually try to pull people in. Uh, they have publications. One's called Voices from the Farm. I know, it's pretty crazy, isn't it? <laughs> and, uh, but uh, <laughs> they also have another one called the Native American Music Directory. Right? Oh, why would it be Native American? What do they use with the music and the dancing? Oh, it gets into an altered drugs. Right? And so they try to pull people into that way. Spiritual midwifery. Right? If you want to have a baby without uh, medication or whatever. So some people choose that. I uh, know some people who've done that. Not against that. Whatever. Uh, but sometimes with that element, you get people who have this kind of new agey kind of mindset. Right? So you've got to be a little bit careful there. And home pest control. I don't know. That really bugs me, Ron. I don't like that technique. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but real quick as we close, because I think I'm going to make my goal. We got one real quick. Just again, we're talking about spinoffs uh, of, of Hinduism. Well, we finally made it to number 10, and I'm just going to give you real quick, and then next week we're going to finally get into the workbook on Buddhism. But I want to give you some, how is Buddhism very much like Hinduism? Okay, well, first of all, they have common origins in uh, southern India, and they've got parallel belief systems built into them. Uh, uh, certain Buddhist teachings uh, have been formulated in response to ideas that were in the uh, Upanishads, from Hinduism, okay, in some cases agreeing with them, so they got a common root there, where'd you get that idea from? Uh, there's significant evidence that both Hinduism and Buddhism were supported by Indian rulers, okay, Buddhist kings continued to revere Hindu deities and teachers, and many Buddhist temples were built under the patronage of, uh, patronage of Hindu rulers, and uh, in fact, this was because Buddhism was never considered an alien religion to that of Hinduism in India, but only as one of the many strains of Hinduism. So they don't, they just, it's just one of the many little offshoots. So they even admit that. They both have, obviously, teachings with karma, which we're going to see with Buddhism. That's very important as well. Uh, uh, and with reincarnation. In fact, the term Buddha is not uh, only solely with uh, Buddhism. Uh, it appeared in the Hindu scriptures before the birth of Gautama Buddha, which is where Buddhism came from, in the Vayu Purana, and the sage Daksha calls Lord Shiva as Buddha. So even that's not even original. Okay, uh, the mudra, mudra are symbolic hand gestures expressing emotion that's used in Hinduism with their deities and they got their different hands and things and like that. Well, what do you see with the statues of Buddha? It's called the mudra thing, so a hand gesture, so that's similar. Uh, the Dharma chakra, that looks like, uh, if you will, like a wagon wheel or like a, a little uh, a steering wheel on an old uh, ship, sailing ship, you know, with the little pegs coming out. And they both have that uh, as one of their deals. The rukshaka, the beads for devotees, for, the, for monks, they both have that. The talak, okay, the bead on the head for the representing the third eye, they both have that. And the swastika, that didn't start with Hitler, okay? And that's a whole other study. You look at Hitler and his uh, version with the Tibetan monks and, and, and Buddhists and stuff in there, and where'd he get that symbol from, and why'd that become a symbol? And man, was he involved with some dark stuff too, as well as an evolutionist, Okay. Why do you think that the uh, Jewish people were the first ones he was slaughtering? Because they were last on his evolutionary list. He felt that they were the closest to pure ape. And in order to achieve the Aryan race, he had to start at the bottom. And guess what? If he would have continued and he would have annihilated the Jewish people, guess who was next? According to his hit list, evolutionary hit list, black African peoples, and then moving up to the Oriental peoples, the Slavics, etc., blah, blah, blah. So that was his plan, all based on evolution uh, as well as being involved uh, in the occult. Of course, they both have the teachings of mantra. Both are big on yoga, okay, Buddhism, Hinduism, and of course, meditation as well. So Buddhism isn't something brand spanking new. As we saw the last three weeks, it's all an offshoot. But look at how many different offshoots, right? And tell me that's not like the evil one, right? 
You look at the history of Satan, right, and his agenda. Genesis 3, when he causes mankind, right, to blow it, right? Approaches Eve, God gave him paradise, right? And then Eve uh, was deceived Adam's sin because he had the authority in the garden, right? And he should have done something. But he went right along with it, all right? So, and that's passed on to the human race. But he thought, aha, I won. No, but what happened right after Adam and Eve sinned? God showed up, Genesis 3, 15, right? And, and, and blood, an animal, a covering, had to atone, right? Right there you have a message of Jesus Christ. Genesis 3, 15, the great promise from God that from the seed of the woman one day, the seed of the serpent, his head, he would be crushed, right? Jesus Christ. So Satan right there in the garden knows that the clock's a ticking. And one day from the seed of the woman uh, is going to come out somebody that's going to undo him, right? He thinks he's one. So what's he do the rest of the Bible? Right? What's he, he immediately begins to permeate wickedness on the planet until the whole planet, as the scripture says in Genesis 6, with the heart of man was continually wicked. So what God do? Right? He almost did it. He almost conquered, except for eight people, knowing his family, right? So God hit a restart button in the flood. All right, so what happened, right? So they start to propagate the earth again. What does Satan do? Come all against again, Genesis 11, and uh, come and let's rebel against God, not do what he says, right? And that's what they started to do. So God came, confused their languages, spread them all over the earth, right? So then what happens? So God's got the Genesis 3.15 promise. He's going to destroy Satan. And so what's he do? So he goes and with the, uh, he begins to raise up Abram. Later became Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, right? Because now the time's come. So from the lineage of Abraham, okay, uh, was going to come the seed. So what's he try to do throughout the scripture to the Jewish people? Destroy him, army after army, even uh, in, uh, with uh, Esther. And, and the, they tried to kill, annihilate the Jewish people. Over and over again, you see Satan trying to kill the Jewish people prior to the, resurre- or prior to the birth of Jesus. Why? Because he's trying to get rid of the Genesis 3.15, the ultimate death nail. So it finally gets in the board, and then Jesus is born. He didn't stop that. couldn't stop that. Nobody can stop God. Okay, but what is, what's King Herod do? He went out and tried to kill him. Who do you think was behind that act? So once again, he's trying to stop the Genesis 3.15 promise. Okay, so you'll, you got to have to have been there. Okay, if you can only imagine when Jesus did die on the cross, right? Satan doesn't know ultimately God's plan. He's not God, right? He must have thought he finally did it. After all these centuries, man, century after century, I've been trying to get rid of these people. I killed the seed. I got rid of them. How many of you guys are saying the angels up there going, nanny, nanny, boo, boo, or, you know, in some sort of angelic language and song? Yeah, and so Jesus was getting, now what? Oh, no. So now Satan knows he's done. Jesus has whipped him on the cross. He's been defeated, right? And he knows that there's a date coming. He's going into the lake of fire, right? It's, it's going to happen. He lost. It's over. You know what he's doing? He's so stinking evil. He's seen how many people he can take with him down to heaven. There's only one way to heaven. So you know what he's been doing ever since that time frame? False path, after 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 false path, path, and how many more just keep on coming, including the farm? He's out there throwing out as many different things to get people distracted and choose the wrong way so they can join him one day in the lake of fire. That's why we need to not just believe what we believe. We need to know why we believe what we believe to give a defense to these people because eternity's on the line. Amen? Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and Get a Life Ministries, and I hope you enjoyed today's study. But in closing, before you go, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? You see, here's the problem. The Bible says that nobody automatically gets to go to heaven, and that's because God is holy and we are not. The Bible says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness, or the wrong things that we have done, have separated us from God. And the wages of our sin, or unholiness, uh, means that we deserve to die and receive God's judgment to go to hell and not heaven. In other words, we're disqualified for heaven. And that's because God being holy and us being not, the two cannot mix. So what are we going to do? Well, that's bad enough. The other problem is we don't even want to admit this dilemma even though God already knows it all. And so out of love, God gave us something called the Ten Commandments to show us that we're really disqualified for heaven. We're not holy, we're not perfect like him. Uh, Let's take a a look at just a few of those uh, here today. Uh, The Bible says, the Ten Commandments says, you shall not bear false witness. That means lying. How many of you have ever told a lie before? 
Well, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just did. Okay, let's be honest, folks. Let's not tell another lie. We've all lied. Well, believe it or not, that disqualifies you for heaven. That's how holy God is. He is the truth. He does not lie. And so that makes us a liar. Another of the Ten Commandments says you shall not steal. Okay, how many have ever taken anything without permission? Well, all of our hands should have went up at that one. Uh, We've already said we're a bunch of liars. Okay, well, we've all done that. And it doesn't have to be a bank. Uh, It could be a pencil in the third grade. Uh, That means that we're a thief, okay? The Bible says that God is so holy, even his name is holy. And that's why one of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. Hey, folks, isn't it ironic how uh, now the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men might be saved, Jesus Christ, has now become a cuss word? Folks, the Bible says that's the sin of blasphemy, okay? And folks, let's be honest. We've used God's name in vain uh, before. The Bible also says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus takes the standard even higher. He says, listen, it's not just physical adultery. He says, surely I tell you that if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. God looks at the heart. One more out of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not murder. And you might say, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? The Bible says that the sin of hatred is akin to the sin of murder. You, in other words, in your heart, wish they were dead. You pull the trigger, if you will, in your own heart. And the Bible says God sees that and it's just as bad. He knows the mind. He knows the hearts, the thoughts, and the intents that we have. Folks, that's just five out of the Ten Commandments. How are you doing? Not very well. None of us can keep them. They're God's x-ray to show us that we're disqualified. And so when, not if, your time comes, because we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, you're going to have to stand before God. And you're going to have to uh, say who you really are. He already knows. Hey, God, let me into heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer, adulterer, and a murderer. Folks, the Bible is clear. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's the problem. Here's the good news. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him, what he did on the cross, on our behalf, that we will not perish, we will not go to hell, but he will give us the gift of eternal life. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of all of our sins. It's something that we don't earn. We, we, we can't earn. It's a gift, the Bible calls it. And a gift cannot be earned. He was taking the death penalty in our place. That's what the cross was of the day. And that if we would just ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and believe that in our heart that God raised him from the grave, showing that his death is satisfactory to God to forgive us of all of our sins, no matter what we've done, the Bible says we shall be saved. Uh, The Apostle Paul says that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave, we will be saved. Let me give you a common analogy of what God's doing and what he did for us with Jesus dying on the cross on our behalf. Uh, In life, we know that people uh, can be sentenced for a crime uh, to where they're actually on death row. Uh, The courtroom scene has completely finished. The gavel has already sounded. Uh, They are going to jail and they're just awaiting their time before they go to the death penalty. Uh, As they're sitting there in the jail cell, Uh, it's a proven fact they did what they did. Everybody knows it. They're just waiting for that time for their uh, number to come up, so to speak, and walk down that hall and be executed. Uh, There's nothing they could do to reverse their crime. No amount of good works in that jail cell can reverse what they've done. It's too late. It's over. But believe it or not, there's one way that people even today can get off a death row. And that's if the one in authority, the governor, If he were to, out of mercy and kindness, nothing that the person did, because they don't earn it and they don't deserve it, and they can't earn it. If he would grant them what's called a pardon, out of the kindness of his heart, he has the authority to grant them a pardon and absolve them completely of their crimes uh, against the state. And did you know that there's actually been people that this has happened to, that the governor, out of mercy, has granted them a pardon as a gift, and they've gone down to the jail cell, And handed that person, extended it through the bars, here, I'm granting you a pardon. If you would just receive it, you can go free right now. And did you know that there's actually been people who've said, no, 
I don't want your pardon. And so what happened is of their own doing, even though they had a way out, they still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, can I tell you something? That's what God did for us with Jesus dying on the cross. He sent his son to take the death penalty in our place. He, God, has the authority to grant us through Jesus a complete pardon. And every day that you're still alive, God is extending to you spiritually this pardon. But a pardon does you no good unless you reach out and receive it by faith. Won't you do that today? Won't you call upon the name of Jesus Christ? Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins, to trust in his work on the cross, to pardon us from all of our crimes, our sins against God. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. But there's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. There's only one way to get off a death row. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. Won't you do that right now? Well, this has been Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and, and Get a Life Ministries. And if there's anything that we can do for you, uh, please don't hesitate uh, to contact us. Uh, our number, our information will uh, come up here on the screen shortly. And uh, uh, if there's anything we could do for you, please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. And uh, remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless.